So we welcome to our virtual stage, um, Carlos Gonzalez, who will present a talk on cuneiform mathematics, a non-exact history of an exact science. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Armando, for the introduction. And um, first of all, I would like to thank you and uh, Alexander Edmonds for the kind invitation you made to me. Also would like to thank the ARWA Association for holding this series of lectures. And of course, I would like to thank everyone who is here online today uh, attending the talk. So um, I'll start with an opinion, my opinion. Um, the way uh, historians of mathematics and Assyriologists have been making headway in the understanding of cuneiform mathematics is a very good example of the relationship between text and history. There is, there is a very good material uh, on the history of the research on the subject. That's to say on the history of historiography of cuneiform mathematics. However, uh, I feel there is not plenty of material, available material, with the aim of explaining to wider audiences what the texts containing cuneiform mathematics were about. So in this talk uh, that I am about to begin, I will try to achieve a balance between two goals, uh, to present cuneiform, some of cuneiform mathematics in a way as clear as I can, and to exemplify how the different mathematical textual genre of cuneiform texts related to each other, uh, thus forming a system of uh, a system in, in which mathematical knowledge could be materialized. So uh, I think I could start sharing my my screen. Um, let's see if this works. I will share the desktop to begin with. Then I will go on to Keynote and uh, uh, there is something, yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Does it work? We can, thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. So, um, yeah. So the first thing I would like to approach um, before really beginning, uh, uh, I would like to spend a few minutes on the issue of what counts as mathematics. Cuneiform mathematics in this conference is the, uh, as you know, the mathematics of ancient Mesopotamia as registered texts in texts using the, the cuneiform script. There might have been other forms of mathematical expression in ancient Mesopotamia, for instance, auto expression, but I'm dealing here only with mathematics expressed in written text. And what counts as mathematics in terms of contents? There are a few approaches to this question. First, we may naively assume that we intuitively know what mathematics is, uh, after all, we have been through a long schooling process where mathematics was one of the central components. In this case, uh, we can simply read cuneiform texts and select which ones or which parts count as mathematics. This is one approach, but there is a risk. The risk, of, I, I think, the risk of this intuitive reading is that we may end up not perceiving the differences between cuneiform mathematics and our mathematics. We may not notice important technical features, such as the inexistence of a proper division. And more importantly, we may fail to grasp the level of sophistication of cuneiform mathematics. A second approach, maybe a critical approach, is to try to specify what mathematics is about or can be about in a more general way and then proceed to identify these traits in the ancient documentation. 
mathematics made us be about the reasoning and demonstration, numbers and geometric figures, counting, measuring, calculating. And I'll try to follow this approach today. And it, an interesting thing uh, is that Mesopotamians didn't, didn't seem to have any word to refer to mathematics, although they had practices which we are used to calling mathematics. They did have words for land measuring, bookkeeping, counting, measuring. They had uh, words for different kinds of additions, uh, subtractions, multiplications. They knew quite a lot about geometry, problem solving, conversion of units. They were also quite knowledgeable about what we call applications of mathematics, which include interest rates, exchange rates, building planning, crop estimations, and other things. But there was no word to refer to all of it as a coherent set of practices. For this reason, in my opinion, the history of Mesopotamian mathematics will always be a non-exact report, although of a so-called exact science. There is another thing I, I, I should tell you before beginning. Just to make it clear, I'll be concerned today only with cuneiform mathematics of the old Babylonian period, because this period has been the most studied in relation to mathematics, and I think it is an excellent starting point. During this period, mathematics can be found or could be found in two kinds of contexts. There are administrative, legal, economic texts that deal with information obtained by counting, measuring, calculating. But there are also texts whose aim was to teach these things. In other words, school texts, which will be the focus of my attention today. Uh, I want to spend a great deal of this talk presenting you a few examples of school tablets containing cuneiform mathematics, plus uh, one example of professional mathematics. Um, while doing this, it will be possible to make some observations on how, in my view, the academic discipline that we call history of cuneiform mathematics has been making the operation from text to history and to exemplify the interconnections of the different types and genres uh, of school mathematics in cuneiform. Also, at the end of each section of my talk, I'll be presenting you some suggestions for further reading I will not comment on any due to time restraints, but you can uh, screen grab the slides if you want to, or the slides if you want to, or you can come back to the internet and see the video again when it becomes available online. So here are two slides with suggested readings related to what I have tweeted so far. Uh, if I can change the slides, how should I? Yeah, so you can screen grab it if, if you want. Uh, you're not obliged to do that. Uh, this is the second one. Um, and now, um, our first text, um, uh, of course, is written on a clay tablet um, that now belongs to the Louvre Museum, the collection of the Louvre Museum in Paris. Its exact provenience is unknown, but the content and style indicates that the tablet was produced during the old Babylonian period. Its museum number is AO8901. The text inscribed on the surface of this tablet is a multiplication table, uh, and the tablet itself is thought to have come from a school environment. It is, according to the research on the subject, a result of the learning process. A student uh, guided by a learned scribe, or maybe by a more advanced fellow student, was gradually introduced in the calculation practices until being able to write down multiplication tables like the one on the slide. From here, the student was probably headed to write in what we call a composite multiplication table. I will show you one a composite table very soon. Um, I know mathematics can be sometimes a little bit intimidating. so. I must make some explanations about numbers in Q&A form, which might help part of the audience to appreciate the contents of this tablet. I apologize to those of you that already know these things. Um, numbers on this tablet 
and others are represented using combinations of two elements, uh, a vertical uh, wedge, uh, um, um, so I don't have a pointer here, so you can see a vertical wedge, which has value one to represent uh, one, and uh, something that we can describe as the head, a very big and uh, turned, 90 degree turned head of a wedge, a wedge head, I'll call it, uh, to represent tense. So, uh, for instance, uh, number 15 is represented by one wedge head followed by five vertical wedges. The number 52 was represented by five wedge heads followed by two vertical wedges. So these are basic examples. Yeah. yeah. One interesting characteristic of numbers on tablets like the one we're about to see is that they behave very much like the minutes and seconds of our clocks. Here are some examples. 7.30. 7.30. Uh, this number can be thought of as 7 times 60 plus 30, which makes 450 units. Second example, 37.30. It can be thought of as 37 times 60 plus 30, which makes 2,280. The last example with three parts, 152, 30. Now we have 60 raised to two. So the number can be thought of as one times 60 raised to two plus 52 times 60 plus 30. This behavior, as I said, is very similar to that of minutes and seconds and the clock. In mathematical lingo, we say that cuneiform numbers are written in base 60. Another interesting feature of this representation of numbers in cuneiform is that there is no separator of the integral part of a number from its fractional part. Um, in English speaking countries, the dot is used as such a separator. For instance, um, uh, I don't have it as, uh, oh yeah, yeah. For instance, 7.5, 7.5 is considered to represent seven and a half. In other languages, the separator is the comma. In my country, seven comma five represents seven and a half. In the cuneiform system, the, there was no separator uh, of the integral, such, such as small part of a number and the fractional part. Uh, um, so if you want some more, uh, fancy examples of what 7 third could mean without the separator. Here are some two examples. They are all written the same way um, in QNA form, and we transliterate them as 7 column 30, for instance. This is one option of transliteration. So let us get back to, to the tablet AO8901. As I mentioned before, this tablet brings multiplication table. Um, as in many other cuneiform multiplication tables, it has a main number or a head number and the results of its multiplication by one, two, three, four, five, and so on uh, until 20, and then by 30, 40, and 50. The main number or the head number, as it is called sometimes of this tablet, is written uh, 7, 30, 7, 30. So you can think of it either as 450 or seven and a half or any other number that when written sexagesimally has digit seven and a digit 30. In order to make our life easier today, I will simply write seven column 30. Also, when making calculations, if we need to, I will take this number to be seven and a half. It will be uh, simpler this way. Um, on the obverse of the tablet that you see on the slide, on its front face, we read the beginning of the first line, uh, seven column 30, followed by some signs that in, indicate the Sumerian word ara, the Sumerian term to indicate multiplication 
which I translated on the slide as times to make things simple. So in the first line of the tablet, we read 730 times one. The result of this multiplication is presented right after. So seven column 30 times one is seven column 30. In the second line we read two is 15. This is indeed the case for seven and a half times, times two is 15. In the following lines, we read times three is 22, 30, times four is 30, times five is 37, 30, and so on. I have some details. Uh, uh, I, I have lost some slides, I think, but I will continue this way. So um, the following lines, uh, we read times uh, three is 22, 30. This is, uh, I, I said, times four is 30, times five is 37, 30, and so on. One interesting line to pay attention to is the multiplication of 730 by eight. It gives one, the result is one. You can think of seven minutes and 30 seconds multiplied by eight. This gives 60 minutes. That's why on the surface of the tablet described could simply write one. The last line on the front face of the tablet reads times 14 is 145. And on the back or the reverse, you have the continuation times 15, 16, and so on, 20, 30, 40, and 50. So the apprentice scribe who wrote this tablet knew at this point not only to multiply 730 by some numbers, the student also knew how to structure this knowledge in a tabular format, reproducing, reproducing a series of multiplications that we also find in dozens of other old Babylonian cuneiform tablets. This is a remarkable feat of schooling, which leads us to the schooling process itself. And I think I could spend two minutes talking about it. First, the shape of this tablet and the disposition of the text on its surface were not chosen at random. Among the tablets that survive from old Babylonian schools, tablets that have a portrait orientation as opposed to landscape orientation, tablets like this, and that contain one complete series of statements uh, about a topic. Here, the multiplication of 730 by other numbers are thought to have been a fixed component of the teaching and learning process. These tablets are the work of students, work students did when they had already committed the text to memory, or perhaps by doing the, this work, students consolidated their committing to memory of the contents being studied. Before reaching this point, students probably copied parts of the multiplication tables, two or three lines at once as registered in one type of school tablets, or possibly copied a few more lines in a two-column two tablet from which one column uh, contained a model written by the teacher, uh, again, as registered in many school tablets that survived to our days. Students' knowledge has been built little by little uh, through a series of structured phases. And in a seriolo seriological literature, these types are called one, two, three, and four. And the phenomenon was first systematized by Miga Silva. 1969, uh, in his edition of the lexical material we refer to as the blue two list. So tablets like AO8901 were made by students that had already worked a little on the subject, but their study didn't stop uh, at this point. Uh, AO8901 is the multiplication table with the head number 730, but we know of multiplication tables with many other different head numbers. And so is, so this is a perfect moment to show you a tablet or not exactly a tablet, an object that contains what we call a composite multiplication table, which is the, which is a sequence of several multiplication tables like the one we have just seen. So here it is, it's a cylinder 
belonging to the collection of the Oriental Institute in Chicago. It comes from the Diala region and it dates to the old Babylonian period. It's A7897, it's museum number. What's this exactly? Uh, after studying each individual multiplication table, students were supposed to produce a composite multiplication table, also called combined this table, uh, which was a sequence of multiplication tables. Uh, um, so I think this is a beautiful example of how different genres of mathematical texts are connected, the individual multiplication table and the composite, as you see here. Um, and again, uh, some uh, further reading. You can screen, screen grab the slide if you want to, or come back to internet after the video is available online. And this, and I think we can move on to our next uh, on, on school tablets. This is very important bibliography and we can move on to another type of tablets. Okay. Um, so this is a different type of tablet, one which contains uh, a different mathematical textual uh, genre. Uh, I am 31, 247 comes from Ishkali, so also from the Diala. Uh, like the cylinder we have just seen, and it belongs to the collection of the Iraq Museum. The front face of the tablet is so damaged that uh, it's not possible to read its contents anymore. The, the reverse, however, is what you see on the slide, is only partially damaged. Um, with the help of what we know from other mathematical tablets containing texts of the same genre, and with the help of what we know specifically from tablets, uh, mathematical tablets from the Diala, especially one that contains a very similar material, it was possible to reconstitute much, much of the contents of the back face of IM31247, a feat performed by Jürgen Friberg and uh, Farouk al -Rawi. This tablet contains nine still uh, readable mathematical problems. Each mathematical problem is made of a statement given the initial data and asking a question, plus a step-by-step -step solution that shows how one can obtain the answer for the question. In mathematics education, this is often called a word problem because the problem is given in words of a natural language, rather than in the unfathomable mathematical symbolism. By the way, there, there was no special mathematical symbolism in the old Babylonian mathematical texts, so problems were always word problems. Um, this problem is about a rectangle in which the width is two-thirds of the length. So we are going to enter uh, we, we're going into detail now. Um, so this problem is about a rectangle. This is a state in the first line of the text, which is formulated as if there were people having a conversation. As you see on the slide, if someone asks you, two thirds of the length is the width. Uh, the next lines, lines two and three, add more information. Uh, I caused the length to multiply the length. Simply, I multiplied the length by itself. The width to multiply the width. I added these values, these multiplications, and it is 2140. And then the question, how much are the length and the width? What are the values? In the first line of, uh, in first part, sorry, of line four, uh, uh, we see something that is reminiscent, that, that reminds us that a, a dialogue is going on. Uh, you, in your doing, this is a very common sentence used to mark up the beginning of the solution procedure. The goal here, remember, is to find the length and the width. The following lines describe assumed 
another rectangle in which the length is one and the width is 40, like this. We have an unknown rectangle and we have a new rectangle that the scribe assumes to exist. Um, with the assumed values, one and 40, the text of the problem orders the reader or maybe the apprentice scribe to perform the same exact operations. So posit one, place one, take one, let one be uh, your length and, and a copy. You have two, one and a copy of one. Multiply them, one comes up, one is the result. Cast down 40, a copy. So make a copy of 40, multiply by 40, your width, 26, 40 comes up and add them. All this is lines four to the beginning of line 10 and the result is 126, 40. Um, I, I want to spend five minutes on the sexagesimal calculations. Uh, in fact, 40 times 40 in sexagesimal notation is 26, 40 as we see on the tablet. In order to convince yourself, you can, for instance, multiply 40 by 40 in the decimal system, obtaining 1,600. Then the division with remainder of 1,600 by 60 provides 26 as the quotient, uh, because 60 fits 26 times in 1,600, and the remainder is 40, and 40 as the remainder. So, the number 1,600 can be written in sexagesimal notation 2640, as we see in the first part of the calculation. 40 times 40 and 2640 comes up. Uh, another way, uh, uh, more historiographically convincing to, to do it is to remember that 40 may be thought of as two thirds in the same way that 40 minutes is two thirds of one hour. So 40 multiplied by 40 may be considered as two thirds of 40. Imagine what two thirds of 40 hours would be if that helps. Two thirds of 39 hours is 26 hours. We take two thirds of the remaining hour, which is 40 minutes. So we have 26 hours and 40 minutes. So, um, we don't need to speak of hours and minutes just doing this in the hope that it helps. Uh, um, so we have 2640, and then we have this add 2640 plus one, and the scribe writes 12640, which is amazing. Uh, um, because um, we could have other possibilities, as you see on the right side of the slide. 2640 could be 2740, a plus one could be 2740, or 2640 plus one could be 2641, possible calculations for other contexts. In this context, context the scribe uh, was able to keep a tight control of the orders of magnitude. Remember that there is no comma separating the integral, integral part and the fractional part. So scribes or people doing calculations had to keep the control of the orders of magnitude in other ways. Uh, so he considers that one is, uh, pertain, belongs to one order of magnitude above 26. I think this is amazing. So summing up what we have so far, take the original rectangle of still unknown dimensions uh, and introduce the rectangle of dimensions one and 40. If you make the series of calculations describing the statement of the problem using the original rectangle of unknown dimensions, the result is 2140. So this is length times length. This is width times width. Add the results, it is 2140. Uh, in, on the other, on the on the right side of, of the slide, it is forty times forty. It is the width times width plus one times one. It makes one twenty six forty. This is what we have so far. The geometrical, one important thing: the geometrical elements on the left are proportional to the geometrical elements on the right for the length and width. 
of the rectangle on the right were chosen to preserve the same ratio of the length and width of the initial rectangle, 140. So that 40 is two thirds of one. Old Babylonian scribes consistently, consistently used the following fact that I will rephrase in modern terms with your permission. Take the ratio of the proportional surfaces. This is the ratio between proportional surfaces, 21, 40 to 126, 40. Um, now calculate its square root. This result, so the result of this square root is equal to the ratio between the unknown length and the assumed length. It's also equal to the ratio between the unknown width and the assumed width 40. In the text of the problem, this is performed not without problems, as we will see soon, from line 10 to the beginning of line 13. It's here. Take the reciprocal of 1, 26, 40. Here, the reciprocal is referred to with the Akkadian word Pani. Multiply it to 21, 40. Um, and 15 comes up. So the multiplication of 21, 40 by the reciprocal of 1, 26, 40 is 15, according to the text. Uh, this is the ratio of the surfaces between the surfaces. And then the scribe asks, or writes, cause the square root of 15 to appear. So calculate the square root and 30 comes up. The result is 30. Um, we can talk about this later, why the square root of 15 is 30. Um, the last lines of the, so, so um, this, is, this is important because this is the ratio, 30 is the ratio between the corresponding sides of the original rectangle and the introduced rectangle of dimensions one and 40. The last lines of the text multiply one by 40 and 30. And we see the final answer in line 14, 30 is your length and 20 is your width. The very final line contains only the word procedure, nepeshum, nepeshum, with the meaning, this is the procedure indicating that the problem ends here. This problem, uh, and, and it, it's not a serious problem if uh, someone was not able to follow all the technical details. I want to emphasize another aspect here. This problem involves knowledge on multiplication, as you see, reciprocals, square roots, topics that were systematized, or at least they were studied in a systematic way in the elementary mathematical curriculum of the old Babylonian scribal schools by means of arithmetical tables like uh, AO, 8901, which we saw a few minutes ago. The systematization of geometrical properties apparently was learned only through problem solving, uh, which occurred with tablets like the one uh, we are analyzing now by means of problems, uh, word problems. So word problems like this are examples of a textual genre intimately connected to multiplication tables and of course to the composite multiplication tables among others. And I hope this helps us to see how the different text, uh, textual genres of mathematical, uh, of cuneiform mathematics were connected and how the study of each one um, must be made in connection with the others. Before we move on, I would like to add a few more interesting information about the problem we have just analyzed. Rectangles in which uh, the width is two thirds of the length, are very common in old Babylonian mathematics. They constitute all the problems in lots of tablets, including the last two in this list, uh, which are tablets containing texts of a different genre, the so-called series texts which contain lists of problem statements without solutions. Um, second point, 
And the problem we've just read, the reciprocal of 12640 does not, in fact, can be calculated in sexagesimal system. Um, in many situations, the scribe, scribes note when this happens. The sentence the scribe used is therefore, uh, I want to say inappropriate, but we can say there is some discrepancy between the sentence he used and what we think uh, reciprocals are and how they behave. In other tablets, in other situations, we see something like, uh, what should you posit to A in order to give B? Which means what multiplied by A it gives B without resorting to the reciprocal. So that's all I had to say about this problem. Some further reading for those who want to make the effort. And this, uh, this is a very interesting publication. It's wonderful. This is the only one I, I'm going to make a comment because um, um, it um, features some objects of the collection of the Oriental Institute and relates them to let us say the same professions uh, from the point of view of today. It's very interesting. Next tablet we are going to see is um, A21948. And we are now entering the realm of the units of measure. It's true that in the previous mathematical problem, we had the measures of the sizes of the rectangles, but you might have noticed that there were no units of measure. Those were abstract measures given as abstract numbers, sexagesimal numbers. So this table, come, this tablet comes from the site of Ishali, again, uh, like the previous one. It's museum number is on the slide, belongs to the Oriental Institute in Chicago. It was edited by Samuel Gringos um, in 1979, 1986. Um, the photo is from the CDLI. Um, so the contents of this tablet are what we call a meteorological table. This kind of table relates measurement values to numbers like the ones we saw in the multiplication table. We saw the numbers, we're going to see measurement values. More precisely, A21948 is a meteorological table of surfaces. So we are talking about areas, surfaces, measurement of surfaces. And it relates these values of surfaces to sexagesimal numbers. For instance, um, uh, yep, for instance, in the fifth, fifth line of the, uh, the front face, the fifth line of the front face, we have a constituted line, we should see one SAR, one, which means that the surface measurement one SAR is related to the sexagesimal number one. In the same way, we read a few lines below, 2 SAR, 2, and 3 SAR, 3. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, in the beginning, if the reconstitution, reconstitution is OK, we read um, half a SAR equals, uh, equals, no, half SAR, 30, which makes sense, because half of a SAR must be related to half of one. And remember that sexagesimal numbers behave like minutes and seconds of the clock. Half a minute is 30. Um, a reconstitution based on what we know of other meteorological tables of surfaces indicates that this tablet, the meteorological table containing values from a third of a SAR to the huge one shard two galgan two, the latter being equivalent to 60 raised to four SAR or 12,960,000 SAR. SAR is a unit of measure used for areas. Such a large range of measurement values may seem overwhelming at first, but in fact, it is handled 
I'm not going to say easily handled. It is handled if one uses sexagesimal numbers. I rearranged the contents of the table uh, in columns, different columns, as shown here. Um, in column A and the next with the numbers, um, there are two sexagesimal cycles from one to 60. I hope you can see it, a simplified one in the top section of column A uh, with values 20, 30, 40, and 50. And then a more granulated cycle of numbers from one to 50. And it could, could go until 60, not 60, but 59, 59, 59. Um, columns B and C each contain a cycle, just one cycle from one to 60. And column D contains just one cycle, followed by the first number of what would be the next cycle. So um, if you go through the columns from left to right, the measurement values get 60 times larger. And this is a meteorological table. Before we move on, yeah, back here. Before we move on, let me make a comment on volumes because we will need it very soon. Um, if you've just seen the meteorological table of surfaces, the good news, it is also valid for volumes. So I, I, I want to make a comment, an observation about volumes. Um, this is a square. Uh, so it has equal sides. Uh, each side measure one end, which is a very common unit of measurement in Old Babylonian uh, times. Uh, we say length. It's a unit of length. It's also a unit of width, if you want, or a unit of distance, if you want. And a square is a square independently of how you see it. In the figure, we have three squares depicted from a different point of view, from different perspectives. I need this because uh, now I'm going to add a thickness to each one of them. I, and I wanted you to see the thickness. These are blocks. And these blocks have the same uh, form. They were built from a square to which we added a thickness of one kush three, which is a unit of length. Uh, very commonly translated as qubit. So, um, surface and volume can be measured with the same unit of measurement. Uh, the square with which we begin, we began, has sides one in the, and its surface is one SAR. It's the, let us say, the definition of SAR. And this, these, forms, 3D forms, have volumes, one SAR, two. They have uh, a base, let us say, of area, one SAR, and the thickness of one Cush, three. So with this in mind, um, I just want to give you some uh, more possible readings. And go on to the last tablet I want to comment on today, Hadad 104. We're going to talk about volumes. So um, a few words about the tablet itself. It comes from Tel Hadad. It dates to the old Babylon period, edited by Michael Rolf and uh, Farouk al Rawi. Uh, it belongs to the collection of the Iraq Museum. It's what we call a problem text with 10 word problems. And we, would, we will take a look at problem seven of this tablet. For it, it will exemplify one of the ways meteorological tables or the knowledge of meteorological tables were used in problem solving, especially in this case where we have a problem on volumes. And reciprocally, I think this problem will also exemplify how problem solving might have helped students to learn how to use meteorological tables. Before proceeding, I must give you some information about meteorological tables 
related to lengths and depths. This is new. Remember that we have seen so far only the meteorological table of surfaces, which can also be applied to volumes, the summer. So here we have uh, one thing that is highly important. Lengths and depths are con conceptualized in different ways in old Babylonian mathematics. And this has to do with the way volumes are conceptualized. As I tried to show two minutes ago, volumes are surfaces endowed with depth or thickness, if you want, or even a height, if you want. The names of the units are the same here, lengths and depths. But the sexagesimal numbers that correspond to measurement values are different in each case. So meteorological tables relate measurement values to sexagesimal numbers. Sexagesimal numbers were what we had in our first tablet, the multiplication table. So here we are relating lengths to sexagesimal numbers and depths to sexagesimal numbers. So um, the sexagesimal numbers, the table of heights, the last column or depths can be obtained from the table of lengths by dividing by five. You see the examples, 10, 10 divided by five is two, five divided by five is one and so on. Alternatively, you can multiply by 12, which is the same thing in the sexagesimal system. With this in mind, let us look again, and let's take a look again at the figure with the volumes one sar. Old Babylonian scribes would say that each of these three dimensional forms have length and width one ninta, while their height is one kush three, one cubit. So take a look at the table. Uh, one ninta is length and its sexagesimal correspondence is one. One kush is depth and it corresponds to the sexagesimal value one. So to obtain the volume of these blocks, we multiply one times one, obtaining the top surface, and multiply it by one, obtaining the volume. So we have to take the sexagesimal numbers of heights and depths from a different meteorological table. Um, this has at least two consequences I am aware of. One has to do with the name of cube and square roots that use Sumerian constructions in the semantic field of equal. The other is related to the practical way of calculating volumes as I have just exemplified, I hope. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry for, for this excursus, but now I, I, I can show you uh, what happens in problem seven of tablets Hadad 104. In the very first sentence of the text, we are informed what it is about. The problem deals with the application of a layer of plaster on a wall. The plaster in this case is eventually referred to simply as clay. Uh, and it's necessary to know the dimensions of the surface that will receive the layer and the thickness. Uh, and of course, the thickness of the desired layer. This is given in the sentences um, that follow the title of the, of the problem. Um, so here it is. Uh, we are informed that the surface has a mitharton, so the surface has the form of a square. Its sides have length two kanum. A kanum is half an inda, so the sides have length one ninda, which corresponds to sexagesimal number one. And the desired thickness, this is really interesting. The desired thickness is one finger corresponding to sexagesimal number 10. I will get back to this slide. One finger, the first unit of measurement in this table corresponds to 10 if it is a length and to two if it is a depth, okay? Um, in order, I can make it 
it will be easier this way. So the meteorological table, meteorological contents and the problem side by side. Um, the scribe is aware of the difference of treatment, the difference in treatment uh, of uh, lengths and depth. So right after stating the question, the scribe makes the necessary conversion to the meteorological table of heights. The scribe says, in your doing, bring down 10, the thickness of the plaster, and two comes up. The cadence verb here is chapalum, which has the meaning of bringing down, uh, lowering. The meteorological values involved are 10 and two. Uh, the following steps are straightforward. It's like, uh, yeah, multiply one by one. It gives the surface of the top of the box. The result is one. Uh, multiply by two, and the result is two, and it corresponds to volume, and the volume comes up. The problem continues, but I will not go into detail, as my intention was to exemplify how the knowledge contained in the meteorological tables intervenes in problem solving. I think the goal has been met. For those who are curious to know what the number two described founds, uh, have found have found represents, it is two sixtieths of a SAR, or two gain two of a SAR. More precise on this, uh, and it co corresponds to, to, to GUR in the capacity system. But I will not go into detail here. And yeah, if you want to know more about uh, conversion between volumes and capacities, and here are some things to read. Okay. Uh, this is the last example uh, outside. This is uh, an example outside the school environment. Um, brief comment. This, uh, I would like to make this brief comment on professional application of mathematics. Um, that mathematics and the daily life were somehow connected. It's possible to see by considering the many mathematical problems that deal with situations uh, coming from specific professional settings. The problem of the application of a layer of clay is an example. And what about the other way around? That's to say, what about traces of school mathematics in texts that resulted from professional practice? They exist too. And I would like to briefly mention one example before we finish. Tablet NBC 11509 contains data and calculation results produced in the plane of canal excavations. Comes from the old Babylon and Lars being recently studied by Robert Mid de Cohen, and it belongs to the Nice collection in Yale. Um, without going into detail, the tablet contains a table with the length, width, depth, and volume of different canals or canal sections. We don't have access to calculations, but by supposing that the canal are block forms, we can easily verify the volumes are correct the text is different from those we believe come from the school environment. In school texts, the calculations are in general explicitly shown, but here we only have the dimensions and the resulting volumes. Um, there is great, the fact that, uh, the fact that there are the similar texts makes it credible to say that this tablet was made by someone who was responsible person for making estimates of volume. But I just wanted to show you this example of mathematics outside the school environment, and you can uh, read the appropriate texts if you want to, to further your knowledge. Or if you already know it, you, you don't need to read. So we arrive at conclusions. I began uh, with an interest on reasoning and demonstrations, numbers and geometrical figures, counting, measuring, calculating. This was our first approach to what counts as mathematics. Um, in my view, uh, it's just th these few texts we've quickly examined, exemplify how different mathematical textual genres were interconnected 
in the old Babylonian period. Notwithstanding the lack of a specific word mathematics, this interconnection established a system of knowledge which may very well be another reason to call it mathematics. So this is what I wanted to present to you. I thank you so very much for your attention. And I think, Armando, we have a Q&A session now. Thank you very much, Carlos.